Thank you for having me and thank you for highlighting on different aspects of uh, palliative care today, the psychosocial, I guess, aspect, which is very important also, as much as the physical and medical aspect. Okay, um, I, uh, I usually, in palliative care, as you may know, uh, we have a team. This team, the palliative care team, consists of physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, uh, pharmacists, uh, that's the team at Balsam. So I'm just a member of uh, that team. I don't work on my own. I always collaborate with my colleagues, my friends uh, in, uh, in the team, within the team. And uh, so we can provide coordinate services to provide the best services to patients. So my role, uh, I have two parts, if I want to say, uh, in my role as a social worker. The first part is a direct role with patients. I assess patients, I assess their psychosocial needs and put a plan of care accordingly. And the other part is indirect role, which is um, uh, directing and guiding, supporting the nurse or any other uh, employee, any nurse or could be nurse or pharmacist or, you know, a physician who are dealing or taking care of the patients. So I support them and guide them uh, on how to communicate with patients, especially if there is some, you know, issues uh, regarding some subject. The nurse is not comfortable to talk about some subject, so I guide her and I support her uh, so she would be comfortable uh, to discuss, uh, discuss such issues. And uh, the other role also is also with my colleagues when I, you know, uh, sense, uh, you know, we have a close relationship, we build a close relationship with our patients. So sometimes when a patient dies, um, the nurse or uh, the physician, uh, you know, they they have they, they suffer also like any other member of the family. So I do watch for any uh, signs of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, feeling kind of feeling, heart feelings or emotions that the nurse or the phys physician would like to express. We discuss all of that feeling openly. Uh, so this is uh, done through counseling usually. And uh, I watch for signs of, you know, burnout or compassion fatigue uh, with my colleagues. So basically that's my, my role. I also connect people and, you know, we cannot, as uh, Balsam, we cannot provide all kinds of services. Sometimes patients need some financial assistance, uh, help with the home health care equipment. We don't provide that at Balsam. So I coordinate and connect people and patients with other community resources when needed. Well, yes, you know, um, in the Middle East, especially in Lebanon and the region, uh, palliative care is relatively new discipline. Um, people, they don't know uh, much about palliative care and its services. And even uh, you will be surprised some physicians, some healthcare, healthcare provider, they're not familiar with the concept of palliative care. So uh, yes, this is a very challenging, it just needs a lot of work actually in our uh, culture. And, um, you know, physicians, they always, primary care physicians, they tend to cure patients. They offer all kinds of treatments so the patient, the patient can live longer. Sometimes they don't accept the idea of uh, people or patients dying. So this prevents uh, uh, physicians from referring patients to palliative care. So a lot of education and training needs to be done uh, with uh, physician and healthcare providing regarding uh, the concept of palliative care. Palliative care is not a competing uh, discipline or field. We, we are, I would say, it's just an extra layer of support even to uh, physician, primary care uh, health providers. Uh, and we, we also just, uh, it's an extra layer, not just to patients and family, but also to physician and healthcare providers. Um, there are actually too many uh, misconceptions about palliative care. Uh, uh, before I, uh, I tackle into the this misconception, there's also, um, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, palliative care uh, um, it's not well integrated in the health system. So we just have in Lebanon few uh, uh, hospitals uh, which offer palliative care services and very few NGOs like Balsam 
uh, which provide the home health care, uh, home based health care, uh, palliative care uh, uh, services. So uh, the limitation of, uh, uh, of services uh, in hospitals or home care uh, services are not available to all patients. And um, the misconception around palliative care. Some people, they avoid palliative care and referral and uh, request for palliative care services because it's related or um, associated with end of life or death, which is, this is not true. Palliative care could start at the time of diagnosis and continue throughout the uh, journey of uh, disease. End of life is just one part of palliative care. It's not all. So this is one of the misconceptions. And because some physician, um, it's hard for, for them to deal with this and they don't want to feel like they're failing their patient. So they keep on uh, trying uh, all uh, these kinds of treatment and aggressive treatment. So they don't tell the patient that uh, there's no more options in terms of treatment. There is always options that always hope can, uh, physicians tend to uh, give hope. They don't want their patient to lose hope. So they don't refer them to palliative care. So they keep on uh, trying and trying with different uh, uh, treatment options, which is sometimes it's not in the uh, benefit of uh, patients. Um, um, also some misconception about palliative care, which is very challenging. Uh, most healthcare provider or people just order or the regular people, they think that palliative care is just only offered for cancer patients, which is not true. Palliative care could be offered to anyone uh, with a disease that uh, has uh, affecting the quality of life of patients, uh, that uh, affecting either due to the uh, treatment, uh, people are suffering from some, some symptoms or from the progression of the disease. So anyone who has symptoms and suffering and uh, uh, affecting his uh, quality of life it could benefit from palliative care. It's, it's not just for one disease. We deal with uh, congestive heart failures, uh, with the neurological diseases, uh, multiple uh, diseases, not just about cancer. The other misconception also associated with palliative care is the age. Uh, palliative care is only offered to, uh, you know, elderly or uh, adult people. This is also not true. Uh, palliative care is offered to people or to patients at any age. Even children can benefit from palliative care. Um, and as I said, uh, 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 palliative care also is offer, is associated with end of life. I just said that end of life is just one part of palliative care, but there's a lot we can do uh, while diagnosed uh, with a terminal illness, and we can support patients throughout their uh, journey with the disease. And even um, after the death of the patient, we have our uh, bereavement program that we continue to support not patient, but their caregivers and staff. Um, in palliative care, uh, we use a set of tools and techniques and skills. And these skills, you know, even in palliative care, we get trained uh, about these communication skills. Um, for each topic, there are set of uh, tools we usually use. For uh, disclosing uh, bad news, we have a set of tools. For uh, discussing goals of care, there is another set of tools. But I'm just, I'm not gonna uh, go into details with each topic. I'm just gonna share with you the very basic uh, uh, skills that we usually use. And anyone in uh, any healthcare provider can use uh, these skills. Um, the first one is active listening. It's when you uh, talk and start a conversation with a patient. Active listening, it's, it's just about hearing what the patient say. It's about reading between the lines. Uh, it's about uh, sometimes just one word could open a whole set of difficult and tough uh, uh, topics to discuss with the patient. So um, when you listen, you want to uh, 
another uh, skill which is very important to your relationship uh, with the, your trusting relationship with the patient is not just judgmental attitude you know we we face with the patients all kinds of emotions or kind of feelings when they express that feeling or that emotion you don't want to judge them on that because if you judge them they will not open again or open up again they won't share their feelings if they feel that you are judging them on a certain uh, reaction or certain feeling so uh, active listening um, not ju- judgmental attitude and uh, empathy showing empathy is, is a very important skill uh, we learn in palliative care and we practice in palliative care with our patients um uh as i said people express and verbalize uh and they show sometimes they cry sometimes they are angry they're frustrated all kind and all uh, range of emotions so naming the emotion is very important it shows the uh, the patient that you understand what they're going through what they're feeling and uh, some don't assume that you understand everything not tell yeah i understand i understand if you can you keep on saying that they won't feel that uh, they need to share their experience because uh, people have different uh, uh, ways to uh, even when one disease people react to this disease in a different ways so it's all about the individual individual and how they're uh, showing their uh, feelings um respecting that feelings whatever it is Uh, understanding and naming the emotion is is a key uh, uh, is a very basic skill you need to use in uh, palliative care all these tools and skills usually are uh, conducted through counseling uh, individual counseling it could be couple count or couple counseling or uh, uh, patient caregiver counseling um we conduct also family meetings sometimes and all these skills usually are uh, used uh, in all these types of uh, counseling or intervention uh, you know families when they are dealing with a terminal illness um this will bring a lot of problems or um, conflicts sometimes uh people want to deal with some issue in different ways um there are too many um problems sometimes we face with families but the one that is mostly common in our our culture is about truth telling families always tend most of them i don't want to say all families but most most families uh, tend to uh, hide the truth from their loved ones from the patients or um they request uh, the, the to they convey their request to the physician primary care physician to not to tell the patient about a diagnosis or prognosis this is a very common issue here in the middle east and in lebanon specifically um there are two point of views or two uh, ways uh, of truth telling in the western communities or western countries there uh, always the physician tend or they think that they believe that patient need uh, need to uh, be told about their diagnosis or prognosis so they tell everyone uh, about that here in the middle east or in uh, lebanon in our culture a family tend to hide the truth from the patient and um, we, we we see it very often to us in palliative care it's not about telling or not telling there is no set rule about that what we usually do is uh, we conduct our needs assessment needs assess- assessment is when you ask the patient what they know about their disease or prognosis if they want to know more about it you assess their readiness to know more so if they're not ready if some uh, patient they would they just go to my daughter ask her she knows everything i don't know anything i don't want to talk about anything in this case you have to respect uh, the patient's willingness of knowing or not knowing if you impose the reality or the tell him the truth this is not going to be helpful honestly so assessing the patient readiness is very important uh, 
when you want to decide if you want to tell uh, the patient about his prognosis or diagnosis. Families always want to protect each other, you know. Uh, it is painful, it is painful uh, when you uh, tell patients about a very poor prognosis or a life-limiting diagnosis. We do understand that, but we try to explain to families when patients are not aware of their diagnosis, this might keep the patient um, isolated, uh, just worrying about uh, many different issues, and not dealing and not verbalizing and not venting and not expressing his feelings and wishes with uh, the family, with other family members. So um, sometimes family, they get convinced and they agree, but they don't know how to uh, communicate such a news with the patient, if, especially if they, they already uh, uh, had the truth uh, and they don't know now how they should tell him um, uh, so we, we help uh, families and we guide them on how to communicate things that. And sometimes families, some families, they don't want to do that on their own. Uh, we do it uh, ourselves as, as professionals. Um, there's always uh, one uh, very important part uh, that families think that when we tell the truth to patients, they will lose hope. Actually, palliative care is all about hope. We, we maintain hope and we, are we, we ensure that hope is still remains. But the, the view of hope is different. What we do in palliative care is hope shifting, what we call hope shifting. Hope shifting is uh, in maintaining hope, but, but shifting it from long-term hope, from uh, uh, unattainable, unrealistic hope, to more realistic, attainable uh, hope. So a patient might not be hoping for a cure, but he might be hoping to be pain-free, to attend uh, his daughter's wedding, uh, attend the cel celebration. So we always work on hope, but we make it more realistic. We help patients uh, make more realistic hopes. Um, so during the illness, we provide counseling to patients and after the death of the patient, we provide counseling and bereavement uh, support to a caregiver or any other family member. Uh, so our bereavement program consists of providing the regular routine uh, support to all bereaved families, which start at one week, um, uh, 40 days six months and one year uh, after the death of a patient. And during this call, usually there are phone calls or visits. We conduct uh, phone calls to uh, caregivers and we assess how uh, caregivers, any other family members are dealing with the loss. If it's all, uh, you know, normal grief, we just support them. If you suspect any complicated grief, uh, uh, we refer, I mean, the nurse uh, usually refer them uh, to, to me. And this is when we start our um, uh, bereavement counseling. Uh, usually um, during uh, the, you, you know, the period of illness, uh, we usually, is, you know, anticipate what's called complicated grief. And this is when you feel like um, caregiver, a, care, a certain caregiver or any family member might have a complicated grief after the death of a patient. Uh, in this case, we follow up all the time. It's not, we don't offer just the routine uh, uh, bereavement uh, uh, follow up. We do uh, counseling. It could be on a, a day, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, monthly basis, depending on how uh, the caregiver is dealing. If this is affecting his daily life, is not coping well, so definitely they need uh, either uh, just counseling or uh, therapy. And during uh, bereavement uh, counseling, we explain and educate people and uh, caregiver about the stages of grief. And we normalize what they're going through, what they're feeling. Uh, we validate their feelings. Most people, they just want to talk about how they're feeling, how uh, the difficulties they're facing after the death of their loved one. And in our culture, we always stand, you know, a uh, relative or friends, they want us to feel better, to get over it, 
in a very uh, sometimes uh, quick uh, time. But you know, uh, grieving person, bereaved person, they need time uh, to process. Uh, we cannot, uh, and there's no right and wrong way to grieve. Sometimes people tell you do this, do that. It's not. Each indiv individual has his and her own way to grieve. There's no right and wrong. And people just want to talk about their feelings, um, no matter what they are. Uh, again, not judgmental being, not gen judgmental is very important when counseling with caregivers. Uh, actually, yes, uh, when we provide our psychosocial, uh, you know, uh, intervention to families, uh, caregivers, not only patients, it makes a big difference in, in how they're dealing with, uh, with the patients. So um, I, we have too many examples, but one very recent one was with a lady who was in her 50s. Uh, she had... Uh, two uh, kids, one son and one daughter. They used to live abroad. Uh, the patient was living on her own. Um, she had the nurse helping her. So the kids came from abroad uh, to help their mom and stay and assist their mom. Uh, the son um, had to uh, go back to his job. He stayed with his mom for a couple of months, but he had to leave uh, uh, because of you know, uh, paperwork and legal and visa issues. Uh, so we worked with the, the son uh, about his feeling, leaving his mom, you know, a uh, feeling of guilt, um, balancing between priorities or prioritizing his job over his mom's care. We work on all of that, he said, but he was okay and he said his goodbye and was uh, peaceful with his uh, decision to go back to work and leave his mom. Although he knew that he might not be able, he might not be able to see her again. He said his goodbye and he left. My work started with the daughter who stayed also who came from abroad. She left her study and she came uh, to take care of her mom. Uh, this lady who is young in her 20s has no experience with illness, how to deal with, you know, her mom while um, uh, has her uh, disease. The mom was bed bound. She needed a lot of, you know, practical help. Uh, the daughter didn't know how to do it, uh, what to do about it. So we started our counseling with the start of the uh, daughter being uh, uh, taking care of her mom. Uh, the daughter was very confused about decisions. She had to make some decision and uh, she was, you know, confused about what people are telling her and uh, conflict. She, she, she felt like she's confused about what people are telling her and what her decision is, especially about end of life uh, uh, feeding. So, you know, in palliative care, end of life uh, feeding is not recommended. The mom was imminently dying and the daughter uh, was pro palliative care. She didn't want her mom to suffer and prolong her suffering. So she was kind of convinced that she doesn't want to uh, use any artificial feeding for her mom. On the other side, the, there were some um, healthcare providers, a nurse, not a palliative oriented, was pushing the daughter and telling her, you're starving your mom to death because you're not feeding her. So the daughter was in a really very confused state. Should she, should she, is she making the right decision? Is she starving her mom to death? So this, uh, this sense, this, this feeling of guilt was hunting the daughter. So what we did, we counseling her, we did, educated her on the you know, benefits and risks there are no benefits actually, but the risk of, you know, end of life feeding. Um, with her, because she was, you know, very well educated and she was, you know, searching for information all the time on the internet, I sent her, I emailed her an art article uh, talking about end of life feeding. So um, she read it, she uh, was more comfortable with her decision, uh, she decided not to do it. And she was at peace. Um, at some point, she was also scared of her mom dying. 
she didn't know what to do. We supported her on all of that. Um, she was overwhelmed because she was the only one taking care of her mom with no uh, uh, support system. Uh, she felt overwhelmed and she wanted to take some breaks, but at the same time she would feel guilty leaving her mom and uh, wondering what if something happened while she's not at home. So we helped her also with that. Uh, we um, encouraged her to take some breaks. She went out with her friend without that feeling. Uh, counseling also continued uh, after the death of, of her mom. After the death of her mom, uh, the daughter had to, you know, go back to her own life, to her own study. Uh, I continued, although she traveled and there, uh, there were no way to, you know, see her face uh, to face and provide psychosocial support in person. I did it over the phone, over video calls, and I continued with the, you know, bereavement counseling. She's doing very well. She's sharing some emotions and she uh, she's, she was worried at some point that she is not crying enough. Um, she basically uh, went back to her normal life. Also, also, sometimes she would feel sad, she would feel uh, uh, anxious, uh, sometimes she would feel uh, uh, frustrated, but all these are very normal uh, emotions in uh, grieving people and bereaved people. So this is one uh, one example of people doing well because we provide psychosocial uh, counseling throughout the uh, illness uh, of you know this daughter's uh, mom. You know we I already discussed that about the misconception of uh, you know palliative care and how they prevent people or patients or even physicians from referring people to palliative care and benefit from its services. Uh, so definitely um, spreading awareness about, about palliative care in the communities and in healthcare communities uh, would definitely help. Uh, you know, palliative care is, is not uh, an easy field to work in. It's very challenging and sometimes uh, emotionally exhausting. It's not for everyone, every, every person, personality. Um, to me, as a social worker, it's a very rewarding field. Um, you know, assisting and helping patients and families, uh, families in such a critical uh, phase of their life is, is to me, is exceptional. Um, but definitely, uh, people, for social workers who want to enter this field and work in this field, uh, they need to be comfortable with the idea of death, uh, of dealing with patients and uh, dealing with patients with some very complicated sometimes problems, social problems, psychological problems. Um, you have to be prepared to discuss uh, very uh, difficult issues. Uh, some people are uh, have fears of that. Uh, so you have to discuss that with them. If you're not comfortable yourself with the idea of that, you won't be able um, to open up or let people feel that you are comfortable uh, to discuss uh, such issue. Uh, Self-care is very important in uh, palliative care. You know, we are uh, trained to help and support patients psychosocially, but we are also human and we are also, uh, we have with our emotions and feelings. So uh, you need to take care of yourself so you can uh, uh, continue to take care of others and offer help. Um, uh, what else uh, for social workers? Um, uh, you know, even sometimes social workers have to keep in mind that, yes, we do help people and we want to uh, solve their problems. But honestly, in reality, this is not realistic. We cannot solve all people's uh, uh, problems. We have to accept that we, yes, we we'll try our best. We try to help our patients, but we cannot fix them and we cannot help them uh, solve all their problems. What's most important is your attitude, your compassionate attitude, your empathetic care that you show to patients. It makes a big difference in patient's care.